Uh, good evening and welcome to the 899th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. And for those of you watching this on the internet, we welcome you. And anybody, if you live in the Boston area, please look us up. Uh, our website is www.atmob.org. That's www.atmog.org. And you're welcome to What did I say? G. You said G. <laughs> A-T-M-O-B.org. Thank you. One of these days I'll get it right. <laughs> Time to turn this thing over here. Uh, we have the meeting meetings from our secretary, Phil Levine. I'm going to give a brief summary. There was a board meeting, executive board meeting at the Westford Clubhouse, May 25. So I'm just going to give a, a quick summary. If you have any questions, um, ask, and I'll try to fill in the details. Um, Jim Geddes gave a update on the Mario Observatory, uh, improvements and repairs made. Um, we discussed the monthly meeting intro by uh, Glenn uh, Chapel, and um, we pretty much decided that it's going to be the, at the discretion of the club president as to how to present it. Yeah, they did say again, that, hey, you're the, you're the one calling the shots, you're the president, but then they said, you know, I'm the president, not the emperor, and I just want to kind of uh, speed things up at these beginnings, so that was the deal. Thank you. One of the topics of discussion was there was an offer from MIT Haystack of a 16-inch Wallace Observatory Telescope, and the board discussed the pluses and minuses. We decided to pass on the offer due to housing, permit, and repair issues. Another item of discussion was purchase of a 25-inch Star Splitter 2 telescope, and the board decided to um, add uh, to the budget for possible purchase, it's not a sure thing, uh, 6000 over a two-year budget cycle, and that's still pending whether um, we will be given the opportunity to purchase that scope. Uh, we finalized the refreshment schedule for the upcoming year. The budget for 2017-2018, um, there was um, a lengthy discussion. Um, Eileen Myers uh, detailed uh, the assets and liabilities of the club. Uh, those will be posted on the ATMOB website. Additional topics, the board voted to approve establishment of a committee to set policy and protocol regarding safe practice use of the machine shop at the Westford Clubhouse and the observatory. The main concern being that these facilities should have a two-person minimum requirement. Um, club membership dues up for renewal June 1st, due by the end of August. Any question on the board meeting? What was the decision on the 16-inch uh, yielding scope? Uh, the decision was made to pass on the purchase of that scope because of um, repair, housing, and permit issues. I'm disappointed. I was project manager on it <laughs> back in the early 1960s. Oh, a long time ago. Paul, you're not the only one that's disappointed. It, it, it just was a daunting task. Yeah. For the Bruce club. Bird and I went out and looked at Tim Brothers was showed it around. Bruce yeah. had a lot of it, it took a good look at it and said that was a problem. And also just getting the housing, that was a huge. Yeah. So then you also get the 25 inch we're looking at. So. It was a tough decision to have to do it. The 25 would be worth well. I'm going to give a, a summary of um, the last monthly meeting held um, at the. Okay. Uh, sorry. Get to the right page. Um, this is a summary of the May 11th, 2017 meeting here last month at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. President Glenn Chapel called the meeting to order at 8 p.m. Phil Levine read the Secretary's report. Eileen Myers presented the Treasurer's report. Chris Ellich presented the membership report. Glenn Chapel presented the observing report. Clubhouse report was given by Steve Clarity. For details, please see the newsletter. Announcements. In appreciation for their help, John Shep thanked the AppMob members who volunteered for the Cambridge Science Festival Sidewalk Astronomy event. Um, old business. Bruce Berger gave an update on Project CAPE. Um, AppMob is providing equipment training to Project CAPE members who will be using this equipment to gather solar data during the August 2017 
total solar eclipse. Um, Glenn conducted a vote to see if we should have a July meeting and the result was favorable. It will be the club's 900th meeting. James Singh gave an update on Project Panoptes. He's fabricating a waterproof casing and mount for a DSLR camera to be used to find transiting exoplanets. Glenn asked a membership if anyone would like to assist uh, Jim and Rhoda Morris. They gave a presentation at the April APMOB meeting. They will be making three telescope replicas, Newtonian, Galilean, and Herschel. And these will be exhibited in China at the world's largest planetarium. Glenn Chapel and Eldon Milani gave the membership an update on the AstroScan telescope and eyepieces donated to a school in Turkey. New business. Glenn encouraged the membership to post a selfie photo of themselves to the AppMob member directory listing. Currently only a few members have done so. Chris Ellich indicated that members could email him for assistance in posting their photo if needed. Kelly Beebe informed the membership about the upcoming International Dark Sky Annual Meeting, which will be held November 10 through 12 here in Boston. There's a link in the newsletter if you're interested in more information on that. Ken Lowney made a presentation regarding an exhibit at the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. Admission is free on Sunday from 11 to 4. Ken mentioned that a number of historically significant memorabilia will be on display. Glenn Chapel introduced a guest speaker for the evening, Kelly Beatty, senior editor at Sky and Telescope magazine. Kelly's talk was entitled Adventures in Chile 24-7 Astronomy. Kelly and his visiting group started their trip at Santiago, site of the National Observatory in Chile and the University of Chile. Um, Kelly and his group visited La Serena, the Cuna, and La Silla, north of Santiago, location of the European Southern Observatory, which is the largest professional astronomical observatory in the world. Um, a few other highlights also visited was the 3.6 meter new technology telescope which pioneered the use of adaptive, adaptive optics. Kelly's group visited a number of tourist observatories in the area of La Serena oh. and indicated that astronomy tour <clears throat> tourism is a significant component of the local economy. The path of totality for the 2019 total solar eclipse will pass through this area in Chile. Kelly mentioned arranging for this trip may be problematic due to infrastructure issues, but indicated sky and telescope will likely sponsor a trip. Glenn Chop will adjourn the meeting at 9.50. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, is Kelly still here? Yeah, thank you for bringing those books. Again, if you haven't, or you got here late, Kelly's bringing some books in. I guess there's samples that are sent to Sky and Telescope. And uh, they're not giving us giveaways this time. We're looking for donations. It's going to go to the IDA, and so you get a chance to browse. Will you be here at the end of the meeting, Kelly? Yes. Okay. And also, Dick Coolish brought some books. I don't know if those are being sold as well, or just they're they're from Stuart Goldman, and they're free, but you can still make a donation to the IDA. You think. <laughs> All right. So we got books in the back. We got books up here. So check them over, and you're welcome to take what you can. But put in a donation. Okay, observing committee report. Let's see what we got going on this time around. Uh, the lights down? Oh, the challenge. I have not done this correctly yet. Now I tap the screen, right? And nothing happens. I tap it again. Oh, we got something. All right. <laughs> and what do I do? Slide? Yeah. Try it. Or video. Video. Let's try video. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> No applause until I get it right the first time. I got another year. Um, I haven't seen a lot of transits of Jupiter, so I'm not a, an expert on this, but I did have to research for an article did for uh, astronomy, my column. And they do tend to come in cycles. And I noticed that Io and Europa are the primary ones because they're the closest moons to Jupiter. And there's like a, a series of them. They'll start off with it. They're very close. The transits are very close. And they start to, start to spread apart. They reach a peak where one of the shadows might arrive about an hour or two before the other. They're visible for a while and then they fade out again. But now we're back to the closing out. And in fact, the one that's on uh, June 19th, 
1004 to 1038, that's the last one of this year. So the last chance we'll get, so we'll hope we'll have some clear skies that particular night. Saturn reaches opposition uh, later this month. It'll be in the constellation Ophiuchus. And it's going to be pretty much, uh, the rings are going to be about as far open as they can possibly be. So it'll be, it'll Saturn will look upright and unusual. It's nearing its most distant uh, position from the sun, but because of the way the rings are angled, uh, it still looks very bright. So that's a, a nice target. And we'll have Saturn around all through the summer and into the fall. The Sioux French Fan Club. And again, I try to go through Sky and Telescope and pick out an object that might be of interest to us. And uh, Rich Nugent is going to bring up, he came up with a list of objects to look at. And it's actually another object in this particular group. This is M104, but near M104 are two very neat asterisms. This is one right here called Jaws. And I've already forgotten what double star this is, but I actually happen to check out this area. Way back in 1979 when I was looking at all these double stars with my little three-inch reflecting <coughs> telescope, and I made notes that this was a really interesting field. It had two eighth magnitude stars right next to them. So just this part alone was very striking in the three-inch. But you add some more stars up here, and supposedly these are the jaws of the shark. This is the back, and I believe this is the fin. It's a very hungry shark. Uh, also in the very area, though, is something called Stargate, and Rich is going to talk about that. So you have really a nice cluster of neat objects uh, right near this, uh, this galaxy. Very nice area to search out. Uh, the LVAS, the Las Vegas Astronomical Society, and again, they feature an object every month. They try to encourage people to uh, observe these objects and fill in reports. And our club has been very good about getting a lot of uh, information into them. Uh, this one is uh, NGC 6015 in Draco, and the way we found it, uh, these three stars, Eta, Theta, and Iota, they actually form a parallelogram with a star up here that's about fifth magnitude, and if you key in on that star, it's a short star hop to 6015. I think Steve, I don't know if it was Rich, we looked at that galaxy with the Steve's 18-inch. Remember, it wasn't very splashy, it was pretty difficult, but that's why they call these challenges. So that might be one you want to check out this month. And again, you're encouraged to send in your uh, just eyepiece impressions, just a little note about it or a sketch, and send it to the LVAS. Uh, Rich, we're going to have him come up. He came up with a bunch of objects that we can look at this oh, month. He's recommended. I just added a sketch I made with my three-inch reflector. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good evening, folks. Um, when I when I got Glenn's email, and I'm sure everybody did, um, asking for some uh, input for objects to look at in the, in the June skies, I came up with um, uh, a, a few of them. One of them was the, the Stargate and the Jaws asterism. Oh. Uh, it, can, is it possible to go back to that Jaws slide? Yeah, let's see. The reason I like this little asterism here, I, I like the, I call this the arrow. It doesn't look like much of an arrow, but it, but it points like an arrow towards M104. And this is actually really pretty easy to find. You can, you can see this little cluster probably in your finder scope. And the Stargate's down right, right about here. And the Stargate is a triangle within a triangle. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but it's a pretty nice object to go and, and look at. And oh, that's it up there. So there's the Stargate up here. Yeah, right up there. And that's kind of fun to look at. Um, while you're on the way to M104, you might as well check that out. Um, these galaxies down here, now I'm going to ask Steve for the numbers because he's the he knows the numbers. They'll go the wool and the spindle. I don't they, have the numbers. You know, they're, they're part of they're, the Virgo cluster. They're yeah. part of the Virgo cluster, which which you're probably thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna go anywhere near there. Oh there they are up there. 4754 and 4762. Thank you, Glenn. Um, they're very close to Vin the Matrix, uh, which is the uh, the left hand last star in the Y of Yerga. And they're pretty high surface brightness. They're brighter than some of the Messe objects. If anybody did the LVAS challenge last month, M98, brutally difficult galaxy. That's a really tough one to see. These are way brighter than that. So those are the fun little galaxies. I especially like these edge-on guys, mm -hmm. just because they typically have nice high surface brightnesses. And it makes them kind of fun and easy to see. The challenge object that I picked for the, you know, the middle of the June sky is uh, the Quasar 3C273. Um, I don't know if you've ever taken the time to go look for that. It's about 12th magnitude. Um, I know a lot of us like to set distance records with our telescopes. And 3C273 is approximately 2 billion light years away. Mm -hmm. So that, it looks like nothing more than a tiny little star in the eyepiece. 
But if you think beyond that, what you're actually looking at, um, single cellular life on Earth. 3.2. It's 3.2? Wow. That's even further than I thought. Mm -hmm. That's 50% that's further. That's cool. That, that's the nice. closest quasar, isn't it? I it's one believe so. so it's one of the, and it's certainly one of the brightest. Uh, because they get pretty faint pretty fast. They're far away. They're far away. And so um, there, you can find finder charts for that um, on the internet quite easily. And uh, so it's a star hop kind of thing. Or if you have a really good go-to telescope, you could probably find it that way. I like the star hop method because I like to be able to map out where I am. And there's a little triangle. I don't have a pointer. Do you have a pointer? Right here. Yeah. Let me see this pointer. It's the top button. So, so of course, they've got the quasar. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> what did you do? Well, there's, there's the laser. Okay, okay, we got this back. Uh, there's the laser button. Laser button's very tall. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. No wonder. So, I feel so. This is the triangle to look behind. This triangle right here. And then within the boundaries of the triangle, you'll see this pair of stars right here. And that's it. And so it's a kind of cool thing to see just because most people don't take the time to go look for it. And it's reasonably easy to find. You just have to you know, get some finer charts and go out there and star hop, and, and it's all yours. Okay. I had some other objects, but they were for, kind of far to the east. But um, you know, the, the whole idea, of, I, I like what you do in asking for input like this. The whole idea is to get you guys out looking through telescopes. And when I say guys, I mean men and women. Get out there and look and observe. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's relaxing. I spent an hour last night looking at M13 through an 8-inch F4 telescope at 36 power. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So just go out and look up. That's what we do, right? So there are some, exactly. there are some things for you to look for. So you'll like those galaxies. Mm -hmm. You'll like the galaxies. So. All right, hey, thanks. All right, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> you thought I was inept with a pointer. <laughs> this time I'm bringing my own one. Well, I'm going to drive home. I'm going to get out of my car, and I'll find this thing in my pocket. It's very easy to forget. <laughs> Uh, a couple of notes. Also, this uh, this is a double star right here. It's Struva 1659. They're both about eighth magnitude, about 30 arc seconds apart or so. But in my notes, again, I saw this with a three-inch scope, so I didn't see the whole thing. I didn't see that star or that one, but that was still neat. I saw this star, and I said flanked by two seventh magnitude stars. But this is an amazing setup when you think about it. It's a stunning object. As far as 3C273, as Rich said, it's around 12th, 13th magnitude. I was able to pick it up years ago with an Edmund Astro scan, a little four-inch scope. Uh, thanks for the update. I thought it was about 2 billion light years away myself. So almost 3 billion or more. That's, uh, you know, you're looking at the past. It's just kind of uh, awe-inspiring. Okay, continuing on. Does anybody have any questions, comments, any additions to make to the observing committee report? All right, thank you. Hey, we have some announcements to make. Uh, first of all, Diana <coughs> Sochi, did I get it right? Uh, she's going to talk about uh, the, 20th, the 2017 Summer Solstice <coughs> celebration. Yes. Oh, is that okay? Oh, my, okay. Yeah, you're a uh, oh, I, I just want to challenge her. Why not? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I'm Diana Hearn. I'm Director of Public Programs for the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with our four museums, Harvard Museum of Natural History, the Harvard Semitic Museum, the Peabody Museum, and the Collection of Historical Scientific Instruments. So every year we have um, a solstice celebration, always on the day of the solstice, June 21st, or June 20th, it all depends, right? And um, at MOBS, who I always called ATMOBs, uh, now I know I have to say this correctly, uh, participated in the 2013 Summer Solstice Celebration and also the 2014 Celebration, and I'm here to um, invite you to participate in this year's celebration. It's Wednesday, um, June 21st. I have some posters that I'll leave with you. And Virginia, I don't know if she's here. Is Virginia? No? So she's um, added a listing for the event on the um, website. So my contact information is there. I also have some cards and I can leave them in the back so you can email me. And so um, I haven't gotten to the details of what you do at the event. So we have, um, we offer free admission to all of our museums between five and nine. We have a lot of hands-on activities and performances along Divinity Avenue, where, where um, two of our museums are located. And then at the Science Plaza, 
um, right before, well, between the, the Science Center and the Harvard Yard. Um, there's a large space where in the past AdMobs have uh, brought their <coughs> telescopes and have set up and have engaged with the public. And I know that there's not always a whole lot to see between five and the time the sun sets. Uh, but I know that there are some celestial bodies that can be seen, and in the past, um, the volunteers who have participated have had a lot of fun, and people have been very excited to interact with, with a telescope. So um, I encourage you to look at the listing on the web page to take a, um, a poster, and if you can't volunteer, you should come out, because we have a great party, it's really fun. Last year we had about 3,000 people, and those are not the people that might interact with you at the plaza, but if you're interested, you might have a couple hundred. Yes? Our biggest problem with the interaction with that event has been parking. Yes, okay, so I know. take that into account. So, back when I first started at my job three years ago, uh, Virginia brought that to my attention, and I know that uh, getting the telescopes to the plaza is a little challenging. So now that I am three years into the job and I know what I'm doing, I actually have parking already, right next to the Science Center. So uh, we also offer free food and t-shirts and uh, just fun interactions. I don't know if anyone has other questions. So parking a set, yes. It just is the runners with water because yeah. runners with water. Yes. It's, it's a hot summer day. Yes. So I actually have that. If you saw my Excel spreadsheet, you would be impressed. <laughs> yeah, the last event we were there, there was, we didn't have any water. Yes, and that was, and there's not a whole lot at the at the science center. So that's why I'm here because I think that there were some, you know, not so great vibes from the last event, and I apologize um, about that, but, and also we moved the event from the plaza to Divinity Avenue because we um, actually have access to that street, we own it, so we can close it and have a party there, but uh, because there's so many buildings there, it's not suitable for telescopes, and that's why I'm having them at the plaza. So again, this is, um, this is a way for me to encourage you. I appreciate what you do. I need to come to these meetings because I do love stars, and I grew up watching stars, but I haven't seen a lot of stars lately. So, um, so if you're interested, I mean, even if it's two or three people, it's, it's all about you. If you want to share what you know and share your equipment with people who are visiting, that would be, that would be awesome. And if there's anything I can do extra to entice you, <laughs> please let me know, and I, and I will. So I hope you can come, all right? And if not, again, just come to party and bring your friends and your family. Yes, I have a lot of these, and I'm going to give you one because I see that there's some interest here. But um, thank you for your time, and have a great meeting. Do you have contact information to contact you? Yes, I'll leave my cards in the back. And uh, by the way, did anyone go to the Diva Sobel talk recently? Yes. Right? Well, we're going to have another talk in the fall, October 4th. Mark your calendars. She's going to talk about um, not... She's not going to give the same talk. It's going to be different. And it's going to be really interesting. <coughs> Apply for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and by the way, just because there's an Aztec name, there are going to be no human sacrifices. So you one are you one sure about that? You didn't ask me to. Uh -oh. okay. Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> okay, uh, I got an email from a gentleman. Uh, let's see if I've got the email right here. Tyler Bruno. And he's from the area, I think he's in Medford, and he's been working out of Myanmar, which is the former Burma down in the uh, near uh, Laos and those countries. Anyway, he wants them to help to set up an observatory, and he's looking for technical assistance, and uh, I know we have plenty of that here, so I'll put, I think I sent out an email, in fact, earlier today, so if anybody's interested, Paul, you said you might be interested in helping out? So Paul Wolf, you want to contact Paul, but certainly help them out. And I guess that will be their first major observatory, a large observatory in Myanmar. So that would be a nice project for us. Do uh, we get to we... go there? <laughs> yep, you got a couple thousand bucks for the flight. <laughs> All right, and next, I got another email. And we have Tyler with Oh, why don't you give us a few, uh... go ahead. Hi, I've been working on I've been working 
out of me and watched for the past four years. And I just recently got in touch with some of the local amateur, amateur yeah, astronomers there. And, um, and they asked me uh, because they needed help to build their observatory there. And, and they knew that I was coming back to the States. So they asked if I could find some type of some type of society to 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 help them out. Thank you very much, Tyler. Appreciate it. Uh, David Barron is going to be giving a couple of eclipse talks. He's in the area. He's a former NPR WBUR science correspondent. And he's giving a pair of eclipse talks. They're coming up fairly spec. They're coming up the next two days. One is June 9th at 7 o'clock at the Harvard Bookstore. So if in the area, and I guess he's written a book about the 1878 total solar eclipse. Now I looked that one up and it was kind of like the one we're having this summer. Uh, a little bit more straight across the country. It starts out in Wyoming, I think goes through Texas. And uh, I happened to look up a little bit, and I think a lot of the really classic uh, eclipse drawings were made during that particular, and the corona was especially vibrant at that time. So I know the talk on the 9th is about that at 9 p.m. I'm assuming he'll be selling books, and you can probably get autographed copies. On the 10th, he'll be at the Museum of Science at 10.30 a.m. Now, he didn't say offhand what the topic was. I don't know if it's another book promotion. I have a sense if it's at the Museum of Science, maybe it's a little more about eclipses in general. So you're certainly welcome uh, to show up there. And I believe we had some more. Somebody want to make an announcement? OK, Dick Coolish. That's right. I need to go get my problem. Okay. So first of all, I got this t-shirt at Ocean State Job Lot. It was astronomical. It was the right price. It was the right size. OK, um, a fellow named Bradley Ross uh, died recently. I don't know whether he was a member of the club. He clearly could have been. I knew him from the Photographic Historical Society. Uh, from the Model Engineering Society and as a volunteer at the, uh, uh, the Charles River Museum of Industry. But anyway, uh, he was a collector of watches and clocks. He was also a hoarder. Um, but anyway, so the, the guy who was taking care of the watches and clocks discovered he had a lot of photographic stuff, and so he called me to go over there and basically advise them. And you know, anything that we think is of value is probably going to go to an auction. Um, but they had this telescope. And uh, this was evidently Bradley's first telescope. I don't quite remember whether they said it, whether he made it or not. Um, it had a, has a three-inch mirror in it from uh, Harry Ross Scientific and Laboratory Apparatus in New York City. Uh, this little mirror cell down at the bottom, which I'm not sure how it's put in because there are no screws on the outside. The focuser is wooden. It looks like the eyepiece might even be wood. It's probably a two-element eyepiece or something like that and a diagonal in there. And as I was thinking, first of all, I wasn't going to take it. And then I decided I probably should. And I'm not particularly nostalgic because it was owned by Bradley. I mean, he was somebody that I knew. I didn't know him that well. But as I started to think about this telescope, this is really a classic example of something that a young amateur astronomer would have made probably in the 40s or 50s. This, this is really the kind of thing they would have done. And so, you know, for, for us who are not quite as young anymore, okay, this is something that we might have encountered in our youth or made something like this or seen in a telescope making book or something like that. And that's kind of what affected me. <coughs> so probably if you looked in the old copies of amateur telescope making, you might see something like this. Um, and I actually think that maybe we should take it to the clubhouse and, you know, put it up on the wall somewhere, just as an example, as a connection to our past, really. But anyway, that's kind of what um, I thought about this. And it's it's a kind of thing, you know, Glenn would be very comfortable with a three-inch telescope, <laughs> you know, all of the things that he had done with it. But again, it was, it was just that connection to previous generations of amateur astronomers, which kind of got to me as I was thinking about it. And Bradley was also a good friend of James Baker, Dr. Yeah. Baker. Dr. Baker. So um, connections going back. Yeah, I guess he, I don't know that he was one of the founders of Computer Corporation of America or something like that. He was associated with that company. What's the book on 
Well, it's from here. It's from about here, you know, so. Um, yeah, chapter 12 somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, there is a little mirror cell. I discovered the mirror was loose today. Um, there, there's a little wooden mirror cell and three little tabs that hold them in. And I'm not sure how one gets the thing back in there. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dick. You know, I wrote a piece, the president's message, and I brought up this nostalgia thing. And I think a lot of us remember that. that I don't know if you want to call it the golden age of astronomy, because I maintain we're still in a golden age. There's so many new things coming up. But I think back, I was in fifth grade when Sputnik was launched. And boy, the push for science back then. A lot of you remember the old Edmund Scientific Catalog. It used to be Edmund Salvage. And uh, I happened to have a, I think it was a 1963 issue of Sky and Telescope. I saved that particular one because that's when I really got into amateur astronomy. And just looking at those ads, I'd like to go back in a time machine and buy an orthoscopic eyepiece for 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, does anybody else have an announcement to make? Okay, thank you. Well, one thing, Slav just got a new telescope, so we're guaranteed to bad weather for my own. Thank you, Slav. <laughs> uh, do we have any old business, any updates to bring up? Okay. Uh, first of all, I didn't mean there's no connection between the graphic and, and, and election of Atmar Bobbins. <laughs> that's just a coincidence. Um, but uh, uh, Chris brought that up before. How is it coming with the, the uh, pictures being sent in? Anybody sending in some pictures? Like two or three. Two or three? <laughs> well, I've got my uh, cell phone camera. We can take care of that today. I'll be walking around. <laughs> Uh, please get those in. I just hate to turn to a page in Atmob and seeing you know, 15 or 20 of these and one or two of real people. So don't take that long. Go ahead and get them in and uh, we'll get this book filled up. Election of Atmob officers. Now I hope I do this right. I've been goofing up every month. On but anyway, this is the slate of officers. President, myself, Glenn Chapel, Vice President, Tom McDonough. Tom, want to stand there? He's way in the back. Uh, Secretary Phil Levine. Treasurer Eileen Myers. Membership Secretary, Chris Elledge, and three memberships, members at large. Maria Batista couldn't be here tonight. Al Takeda and Bruce Tinkler. Now, we're supposed to ask if there's anybody that has a nomination from the floor, but that should have been made for the Secretary. Bill tells me nobody did, so I think this is the slate. And I understand just a voice vote. Okay, so all in favor of this slate, say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's done. Hey, thank you very much. And I want to thank all the folks that did decide to run with me. Because apparently you can put up with me and uh, we'll go for another year. Okay, next month we're going to be doing speakers night. Now, I believe there were three people and I couldn't find the third people person, but uh, Howard Laveau is going to give a talk and it should be the IGY, not the IGA. I thought it was a grocery store with those initials. Wow, that's really taking me. Uh, International Geophysical Year, again, back to those golden days of science, back after, in fact, Sputney was part of the IGY. Um, but he's going to talk about his adventure. He was in uh, Antarctica for about, what, 14, 15 months? And so he's going to make a presentation about that at the next meeting. And Jim Mahoney, Jim is right here. And Jim's going to give a talk on obtaining red mode for an iPhone or iPad. I did say that correctly, right? And you've already shown that to a couple people at the club. It's kind of a neat thing to know how. So bring your iPhones or iPads if you're not familiar like that. They're, Mario's already done. He's showing off. But that's what we're looking for. Just get yeah, that red mode. He found kind of a shortcut to do. Yeah, OK. You well, I think uh, Jim has showed a couple people at the clubhouse how to do that. And Mario already knew that anyway. So. But anyway, that's the other talk. Was there anybody else that had a thought about giving a talk? I, yeah, yeah. I approached Julie Sage to talk about the Cubes in Space project out of the Clay Center Observatory. And uh, her YouTube channel on supernova science. <coughs> uh, she hasn't committed yet, but I expect she will. Okay, would you please and email our, me? I remember yeah. there was a third one and I couldn't find I, it. So I'm waiting for commitment first. All right. She's very busy right now, so she wanted to take a couple of days. Uh, the rocket will have flown by the July meeting, so we might actually uh, even have data at that point. So I'm, I'm going to encourage her to do it. How old is she again? 13. 13. 
And we had Ariana who's poor. Oh, by the way, with Ariana and Project Kate, she did get all the money. So that's, that was done. As soon as I can get her to commit, I will. I think we can go with these three talks. So that should fill up. If she can't, I'll put something out if anybody else wants to give a 10 minute or so talk as well. All right, that brings us to our speaker tonight. Now I'm going to read the bio while the, we're getting switched over here. Eileen's going to take up the collection for Clear Dark Sky, which again is on our website, very useful tool. And uh, I'll be reading the introduction, so please try to remain quiet and uh, we'll get going. Oh. Okay. W. Lowell Putnam is the great-grandnephew of the astronomer Percival Lowell. He's serving as the fifth sole trustee of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, having succeeded his father Bill in 2013. He also serves as one of seven members of the Board of Trustees of the Lowell Observatory Foundation. By the way, his car is out there. He has Lowell Observatory logos on the side. He called me to say would it be safe to park here, would it be towed? I think if you get Lowell Observatory stickers on the side, you're pretty safe. In 1984, uh, Lowell founded Video Communications, Inc., a software company specializing in business systems for TV networks, cable channels, and local TV stations. Clients include the Weather Channel, Comcast, uh, Univision, and about 25% of the TV stations in the U.S. and Canada. In 2010, Lowell sold the company and became the trust administrator for Lowell Observatory. He is currently director of People Hedge, which is a Boston-based firm dealing in currency exchange. Uh, Lowell holds a BS in psychology from American International College in Massachusetts, Springfield, I believe. Yes, indeed. And is a life member of the American Alpine Club and the Nature Conservatory. <laughs> He'll be talking about the Lowell Observatory. So I welcome Lowell Hutton. <laughs> Thank you all for having me here this evening. Um, is this working for everybody? Yes. Yeah. Oh, now the magic light. I'm the expert. There we go. All right. So I just need to make sure I hit the right button on my keyboard here. So uh, as we discussed, this is really uh, a talk about Lowell Observatory, both historically. Um, where we're at today and, and also some of the new research that we're just starting uh, and going forward from there. I also uh, have brought in uh, some video images from the New Horizons mission and uh, a, a fascinating YouTube that I found from a gentleman in uh, Finland who clearly has a lot of spare time, uh, but it is, it is really interesting to look at. So. Um, Let's start a little bit. Uh, this is the topics I'm going to cover. Um, Lowell Observatory has a very unique governance. Uh, it's called the Sole Trusteeship. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, as I said, uh, some, some interesting videos along the way. So first, um, very distinguished uh, photograph there of our, our founder and my great grand uncle. Um, first of all, was a Boston native. Lowell family is fairly well known in this area. Uh, he, uh, as all the males did in that family, went to Harvard. Um, actually, I'm the first one in my family line not to go to Harvard. I don't know what that means, but anyway. There you go. He was uh, a world traveler, went off and spent a lot of time in uh, the Far East, uh, Japan and Korea, taught himself uh, both languages. Uh, he went to MIT uh, after he left Harvard. His uh, professors at MIT said he was the brightest mathematical mind of his generation. Uh, he ran the family finances for the mills. Uh, his mother's name was, um, his name was Lawrence. So when I say the mills, I do mean Lowell and Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, he came back and wrote several books uh, about his uh, trips in the Far East. Uh, he was the first Western Westerner to go to parts of Japan. Um, represented a, uh, a Korean delegation, the first Korean business delegation to the United States. Uh, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1892, prior to when he then took up his interest in astronomy. His election was based on his work that he had done uh, in the Far East. And um, as 
where he became known to all of us, his fascination with astronomy and the close approach of Mars that occurred in 1894. So he sent A.O. Douglas, who was a professor at Harvard, out to the southwest, American southwest and northern Mexico, to go search for a site that had good seeing. This is the first um, modern observatory that was located where the scene was good as compared to for the convenience of the researcher. Um, he's famous obviously for promoting the theory of life on Mars. He was a very articulate speaker um, uh, and uh, people have, have talked about him being the Carl Sagan of the early 20th century. He, he, he was uh, very good and believed very much in bringing science to the general public in a way that could create very good engagement. Um, he did the calculations uh, and hired the others to determine, go after what was the, at that time called Planet X, um, what we now know as Pluto. Um, as I said, he's very, a very popularizer of both science and astronomy specifically. Uh, if you read the introductions to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds or Edgar Rice Barrow's books on uh, John Carter, they talk about the influence of Percival Lowell, which led them to come up with their science fiction. And I find that very interesting because if you go a generation later and you read some of the bios and, and uh, biography work of a lot of the um, early space missions, space race engineers, and indeed the astronauts, a lot of them say that they were influenced by reading Edgar Rice Burroughs and H.G. Wells to pursue a career in space. Um, but his longest lasting uh, piece of work was establishing the trust for the Lowell Observatory. Uh, and that's a quote from his book, for carrying on the study of astronomy. And so now you end up with me here talking to you. Um, one of the key pieces of work they did and, and, and part of the culture of the observatory was to give a good scientist the, the best equipment that he could find and give them the time to go to the research. And so, um, in 1912, uh, V.M. Slifer uh, stood up and made a presentation at the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting in Chicago on his observational work on um, what, we, what was then called spiral nebulae. Um, and it is the first published data that shows the universe is expanding. Um, in the audience, he received a standing ovation for his presentation, which, by the way, basically blew up all the models that people had of what the universe was. And um, in the audience there was, among other people, um, a young astronomer named Hubble. Um, you may remember him because about 15 years later he figured out what this data meant. And so now we have the theory of the expanding universe. Um, we talked about Pluto. So Percival died in uh, 1916. And, um, the research languished for a few years. His brother uh, kicked in some money and uh, built a new telescope. They hired a young Kansas farm boy who was an amateur astronomer. And um, somebody once said to me, uh, the data on of the supposed perturbations in the uh, orbits of Uranus and Neptune um, that Percival Lowell used and a lot of other people used to try and figure, said, oh, there must be a body affecting them. Let's go look for it. Uh, that data turned out to be false. So Percival Lowell was looking for a ghost. Clyde Tombaugh found the ghost. Uh, it's a little bit of an irony there uh, in it. Um, and when you consider the fact of the technology he had available to them, the next Kuiper Belt object was not found for another 60 years. It's a pretty phenomenal thing. Um, and I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at the plates is on, but the ink, the, the OCD requirement of being able to find that dot and make it move is, is just incredible. Uh, other things that have happened in the past with the observatory, the uh, lunar landing maps for the Apollo missions were all developed at Lowell Observatory, uh, sort of one of those little known facts. Uh, the Apollo astronauts, as I was saying at dinner, um, actually came out to the observatory for training uh, to look at the maps I looked through the telescope, discussed with scientists, and also to go over to Meteor Crater so that they could do some understanding of when they were landing in there at the impact side of the crater, if you know where to walk on the scatter pattern, you actually can pick up samples that are from further down inside the surface. So that's why the, 
rather than t bring a drill up to drill into the lunar surface, they simply walked out the scatter pattern. And that's how they were able to bring back samples that were from further on inside the moon. Um, current research, um, a substantial amount. In, in, in several years, the largest amount of time on the Hubble was actually done to low uh, observers, astronomers. Uh, we, um, we are part of a team that uh, works on SOFIA. I don't know if people know what SOFIA is, but you take a perfectly good 747 and then you cut a hole in it. Uh, uh, put a door on, put a 10 meter telescope on a bunch of inner tubes, uh, and go fly it up at 45,000 feet and uh, get out of the Earth's atmosphere as much as you can in the moisture content and you can do a whole bunch of observing. Um, we developed uh, one of the major instruments that is used on SOFIA and have flown regular missions on it. Um, outside of the, uh, the Kara universities, um, a significant amount of the time on the Keck goes below the observers. Uh, it's, if you're an astronomer, um, the observatory is a wonderful place because there's no teaching requirement. Uh, it's full academic freedom. You go after your area of research and you can just go after it for decades. Um, we, will, we will support you. So, it's a, it's a, we get really good people and they get to do really good work long term. How do we um, get tech time? Uh, you, it's a competitive evaluation, but our people, the research, kind of research they do. And you apply. You apply for it and then you have to get out. Yeah, and, and, and then God help you if something goes wrong that evening because it's like now you're at the back of the queue again. <laughs> um, Ted Dunham, uh, one of our, uh, uh, our sort of premier instrument scientists, um, uh, was uh, one of the lead PIs uh, on the Kepler mission uh, as, as another place. Will Grundy uh, is the surface composition uh, lead on the science uh, team for the New Horizons mission. It's just a couple of our people. You'll hear from uh, another one of our scientists in just a moment. A little bit about our facilities. We're unique because we actually own our own telescopes. Um, so our people in doing their research can um, when they submit, they can say, I have the access time. Uh, whereas if you're a researcher at a, 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 a college or institution that doesn't own some telescopes, you can't guarantee you've got the time to say, if I get, you know, if, if you get me this research, then I will apply for time on some public telescope, maybe at Kitt Peak or wherever I can get the time. Uh, but it's a risk. So this is a view from the south, looking north towards the San Francisco peaks. Um, by the way, the San Francisco peaks you see there, that's actually the edge of a rim of an ancient volcano. And when you look at a map, it was a really big volcano. Um, so there, Flagstaff is, is at the bottom, and we are, uh, number one there is our campus, uh, Mars Hill, and it is just on the west side of Flagstaff, for those who haven't been to visit, right outside of downtown. Uh, in the 1960s, we used to do all our science on Mars Hill. It was up high enough above Flagstaff. Flagstaff was small enough that it was good dark skies. Um, but Flagstaff has grown, even though they've got great dark sky provisions. It's, it's a model for the world. You can stand in on Main Street in downtown Flagstaff and see the Milky Way. So um, that's that's pretty good. Uh, so in the 1960s, uh, as in, you know. Slight, slightly more civilization in Flagstaff proper, um, more sensitivity on the instruments. We moved out to Anderson Mesa. Uh, this is about uh, nine miles uh, away. Uh, number two there, those two uh, telescope domes hold the Perkins telescope. Uh, it's about a 1.8 meter. And uh, the 42-inch uh, the telescope. Number three is a, a wide angle of the Schmidt telescope that we have. The little one in the back, 14, that's actually a, a highly automated uh, telescope that we use. Uh, uh, we encourage uh, undergraduate uh, researcher, uh, some neuro, if people know that acronym. Um, and we make that available for a lot of um, small colleges around the country to help with their training programs and stuff like that. Number five here um, is an optical interferometer. It's the Naval Precision Optical Interferometer. Uh, largest baseline optical interferometer in the world. Uh, it's going through an upgrade right now. Um, for those who don't know what an optical interferometer is, uh, if you can imagine that you had a telescope with a mirror that went from there all the way out to the far end over there, was that all the way around, you smashed it, and all you had was a few pieces of glass left. Um, if you could somehow bring all of them to line up on the same object and bring their light to the collector at the same wavelength of light, 
then you create an image. And that's exactly what they do here. They, uh, tolerance is here when they bring the light together is to within 10 nanometers. Uh, basically a single wavelength. And you're, you're down in the quantum effects area. It's pretty well. Um, our newest instrument, and we'll see some video of this in a bit, is the 4.3 meter Discovery Channel telescope. Um, it saw first light in 2012, was in full science commission at the end of 2013. Um, no single institution in the world has ever built a four meter class telescope on their own. Um, we did when we first started proposing it. People said, well, they said silly things on that. Um, but uh, we were successful. And um, so uh, it is uh, by, we have some science partners, BU, here in town is one of them. And um, Toledo, Yale, uh, Maryland, um, they have all said, people have used it, this is the best performing four-meter class telescope in the world. It's, it's an incredibly efficient, nice, well-behaved telescope. Um, and so it allows people to be very, very efficient with their observing time, which is, which is very important. Um, give you a little bit of idea about the kind of research we do. Um, I said, uh, at dinner we have 14 uh, PhD tenured PhD researchers um, and then a variety of postdocs, pre-docs. And it's a, it's a really great team because they do a lot of research and there's a lot of relationships between the research. Obviously, given where Percival is interested, we start with our solar system and uh, trying to understand um, all of the various bodies in our solar system, the, the small body research. Uh, we have some world-class experts on both comets and meteors. Uh, Nick Moskowitz is hiding around there and Dave Schleicher. Um, New Horizons team, that's Will Grundy there and the, uh, uh, that, of the triumvirate there, that's Will and New Horizons. And obviously understanding our solar system requires understanding our own sun. Uh, it's nice to have a good star nearby to look at uh, and understand. Unfortunately, it's a middle-aged star. Not, you know, kind of like how do you understand babies if all you got to look at is a 45-year-old man? It's just not quite the same. So we look at other stars um, and and do a lot of research on those. Looking at our own solar system, that's nice and it's an interesting model. But as we are learning more and more, it's not the model. There's more than one model for how solar systems form, planetary bodies form. So a lot of work around exoplanets, um, and I'll talk about some of that. And then into galaxy uh, and galaxy formation and some of the fundamentals of our universe, uh, which will be I'll presenting a video of Deidre Hunter here, who has spent um, over 35 years of her career understanding dwarf irregular galaxies. Uh, and we get some understanding from her. It's also an interesting conversation because um, she gives an answer, which I think is a really nice one, about why would you be an astronomer? We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the connection to Massachusetts uh, goes back to, as I said, the governance structure of, of the observatory. Uh, Percival's father was uh, the sole trustee of a uh, Boston institution called the Lowell Institute. Um, the Lowell Institute is, by the way, the institution that uh, created WGBA. Um, initial funding for that. Uh, basically, it, it, its uh, mission is to promote um, sort of non-standard education. Uh, it, it used to and still does free public lectures, but it does a lot more things now uh, as well as, uh, and its current sole trustee is uh, an eighth cousin of mine uh, named Bill Lowell. So the idea was, uh, for those of you who've been on boards and, and or looked at organizations, Sometimes when you have a board, the individual members all think that somebody else is keeping an eye on the shop, and then things go off the rail and everybody realizes that nobody was keeping an eye on the shop. Uh, the idea behind a sole trusteeship is that if somebody willingly takes on the role, <coughs> there's nowhere to hide. So they're going to pay attention and, and keep an eye on things. Um, there are only two sole trusteeships in the United States, the whole Institute the whole Observatory, so obviously not everybody else thinks it's a great idea. But we are here. The first um, first trustee was Guy Lowell, uh, took over Percival's death in 1916. He was a uh, very famous uh, American architect. Um, the 
Boston Museum of Modern Art uh, was, uh, was designed by him, as was the, um, the uh, old courthouse uh, down by the state house. Uh, when Guy died in 1927, my grandfather Roger became the trustee, served as trustee for 40 years. He took over when he was uh, 34 years old um, and um, got the joy of, of getting things out of banknotes, personal estate, out of banknotes and into the stock market just in time for 1929. <laughs> uh, and then figured out how to keep the place going uh, from there. Um, he uh, retired in 1967. Uh, my uncle Michael Putnam uh, took over then and served as the sole trustee for 20 years. He was then asked to take over as uh, president of the American Academy in Rome. Uh, so he left for Italy uh, and passed it off to my father, um, who had just sold his business. And uh, I took over as trust administrator, as my bio said, in 2010 when I sold my company. My father decided three years later that I could have it and he could goof off, so I became a trustee in 2013. So, um, let me, uh, I'm going to figure out how I make this happen here on this thing. Uh, should be a, how do I make it play video? There we go. There we go. Let's go. Here you go. This is the new telescope. regular galaxies don't have this density, and yet we can see stars forming inside them. What I would like to do is answer the big question for dwarf rays, which is how do they form clouds and form stars? If you look at the sky at night, you see all these stars in the sky, and we tend to think of the space between them as being empty. Uh, it's not. It's full of this very tenuous gas. Occasionally, this gas will come together into a cloud, and then gravity pulls it together further, making it a dense, cold cloud. So then the stars form out of that, those kinds of, they're called molecular clouds. understand more about how stars formed in these cold molecular clouds, Dijero will head to the Discovery Channel Telescope, where she waits for the sun to go down to set up on a galaxy where she hopes to find some answers. The galaxies that I've chosen are a subset of a sample that's part of a project called Little Things. I'm using the camera to take images. And the purpose of these images is to go very, very deep so that we can study the outer bits of stars in these galaxies. I observe in four, four different, through four different filters, from the ultraviolet, blue, green, and red. And the purpose is that to see what kinds of stars are out there. By, by looking at dwarf galaxies, we're looking at an environment where star formation isn't explained by the current models, but 
if we look at any far outer disks of bird galaxies, we're looking at an even more extreme environment. And so if we can look out there, if we can see star formation going on out there, then we, we, we just we poked a really big hole in the line. For Deidre to go deep enough to see star formation in the outer disks, she will spend two and a half nights to get the full spectrum of a single galaxy. The answers Deidre is looking for in these dwarf galaxies could also have implications in other questions about our universe. As for example, how it began. In the early universe, when the first stars formed, they formed out of a gas that was primarily hydrogen and helium atoms, and not any of uh, the heavier elements like carbon, um, nitrogen, oxygen that we um, see so much on Earth. So that raises a question, well, how did those first stars form then without the benefit of those heavier elements? The gas around the first stars would have been pristine Nothing like the gas we have now in the Milky Way. The closest thing we have to that kind of gas is what you find in dwarf or regular galaxies. If we can understand more about star formation in dwarf or regular galaxies, we might come that much closer to understanding the mystery of how the very first star in the universe was born. <coughs> You can see that there's, you can see why you have to expose a lot. You want to go really deep and the galaxy. Now, it's not something you discover because it's not just going to happen overnight. I've been working on it for over 30 years um, already. And so it's just something that you work at. You do one thing and then you do another and you think of something else and you do this and you this and you just try to put all these pieces together over time and hope that eventually you can make up a picture that actually um, makes sense. But there's this little tiny dwarf radio galaxy and um, it's, it's, um, it has um, a little bit of star information going on it, but not a whole lot. Just, it gives us a sense of our place in the universe. We went from this big bang where there was nothing but some atoms and dark matter to people sitting around eating with friends. I mean, what a journey that is. <laughs> and so, you know, while the dwarf regular galaxies are only a piece of this whole thing, we're trying to put this big picture together to understand the universe that we're in and understand this journey that our universe is going and we, we truly are a part of it. had the academic freedom to pursue this research for over 30 years. And that's very, very neat. And she's been able to work at it full time. She she and her team are they really are teasing out some very interesting data. They actually now have uh, figured out that that part of what's going on there, and that's why star formation can occur, is that there's enough dark matter uh, and 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 gravitational pull there that the gas it's almost like it, it it, it, it ripples, so it gets some some bounce, and there's more more concentration and less concentration. And periodically, apparently, there's enough concentration of the gas that then you get a you get a, a, a fusion start. And but up until that model is that's new. I mean, uh, that's stuff that you know, it didn't fit the existing model, and it's taken her this long to work through to get to where we understand some of this 
and how it could have occurred at the beginning of the universe. Um, I'm going to shift from um, uh, galaxies at the far side of the universe to um, close in. Uh, this is the video I was talking to you about, this gentleman um, and gentleman put it together. So uh, we now have enough um, satellites moving around various parts of our solar system that we're getting, with current technology, we're getting some incredible images. And this gentleman decided to put together using the German satellite that's going around that's getting high definition images off of Mars, what it would be like to be in an airliner flying above Mars at about 30,000 feet. And it's kind of fun, so I thought I'd get it. There's Phobos, that's the moon. And there's Mars in the background. These are all real images. I think of vanilla ice cream, vanilla bean ice cream. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's our closest neighbor. And we've got a whole bunch of things looking around that. Talk a little bit about New Horizons. Um, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to listen to Alan Stern, uh, who was the PI on New Horizons. Uh, he tells the story a lot better than I do. But um, the only institution involved with the New Horizons mission that was around when Pluto was discovered is the Lowell Observatory. Uh, so five members of the New Horizons science team uh, either are or have worked at Lowell Observatory uh, on a 25-person team. But um, obviously we didn't have the kind of money that, that NASA and Johns Hopkins and uh, Suri had, but we had some, some good people. New Horizons is about the size of a baby grand piano. It's about that shape, too. Um, as a way of controlling mass uh, and, and controlling simplicity, communications disk on it is fixed mounted. So to aim the communications disk, you actually turn the spacecraft itself. Um, the transmission power from there is the equivalent of three night lights, about 28 watts. Um, and it sends its data back um, through billions of miles on about a four and a half hour journey. Now it's getting a little longer than that. Um, to the Deep Space Network um, to, to pull in the signals and the images that you're about to see. But um, it's a really interesting piece of, uh, they had, this is a NASA mission, they had three years from the time NASA told them to go, the time that they had to have a spacecraft and rocket ready to launch. This is one of the fastest missions that NASA has ever done. And it set a model for how they can do missions in the future. Uh, so pretty phenomenal. Um, also, the fastest um, launch object to uh, leave Earth orbit. Um, it went from the Earth to the Moon in uh, eight and a half hours. Uh, it, well, it's you know it's amazing what you do when um, you buy an Atlas V rocket. You put uh, five boosters around it. Um, because the uh, cargo uh, fairing space in there is designed to launch uh, satellites that are the size of a school bus, when all you have is something the size of a baby grand piano, you got a lot more empty space inside. So what you do is you go buy yourself another solid fuel rocket, you put that inside, and you put New Horizons on top of that, and you launch that thing. Uh, up they at one point in time uh, hit uh, 55,000 miles an hour. Um, they were so precise in the delivery of that into the uh, Jupiter orbit where they were going to pick up, a, a, call it a slingshot, but they were going to gain some angular momentum uh, going around Jupiter. Uh, they hit it so precisely that the only course correction they had to do was six months later and they had to correct the spacecraft speed by 10 miles an hour. Um, the United States is the only country to have visited every major body in our solar system. We've put a mission to every planet in the solar system. And that's, that's something we're really proud of in terms of equipment too. So what I'm going to show you here are um, three uh, composite uh, uh, videos that come from the New Horizons mission and give you an idea of uh, the level of depth and detail that uh, this, uh, this baby grand piano was able to come up with. Uh, so the first one is um, show you the kind of high definition images that we're getting. Um, there's one image and we'll zoom in on that here. And so a single pixel on this and the ones you're going to be looking at are um, about the size of an Olympic swimming pool. Um, so it's pretty good detail uh, and, and sent back here. Uh, the model of the theory, the theoretical model of Pluto said that Pluto was going to be a dull icy rock that had been beaten on by other dull icy rocks. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that was the model. Um, and when Will was pushed, you know, the, rocket launched nine years later before it actually gets to Pluto, 
what are you expecting to find? And the answer is, we don't know, but it's going to be a surprise. Whatever we think we're going to find, it's not going to be what we think. And uh, indeed, um, to give you an idea, oops, right here. Get this one to play. Come on. You can go back. So this is one of the fly out. This is a, a stitched together image of, of, the, of those images into a movie. It's smooth. There. It's not down over there. It shouldn't be smooth. Smooth means there's an activity. If, 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 if you look at Pluto, there's a one impact over there, but there are lots of impacts. Impact should be not only in one place. It should be all over the surface. So if there were impacts, something in Pluto, on Pluto's surface, is actively working to create new surface and to create smooth surface. That doesn't make sense uh, against the existing model. Pluto shouldn't have tectonic activity. But it does. You can see here some examples smoothing this out over there, and then you've got terrain. Pluto has mountains of ice, and it is water ice, that are 12,000 feet tall. This is a planet that's the size of Texas. Okay, 12,000 feet is incredible. Uh, and we know it's water ice, it's not methane or nitrogen, because they basically, when they're that cold out there, they're more like sand, so they just do grain, they, want, they can't create a structure that can have that kind of integrity. Um, but you can see some of the stuff. Um, you don't see a lot of color imaging out here, uh, in part uh, equipment sensitivity and the fact that it's really, really dark. The sun is really, really faint uh, by the time you get out there. So um, here's just one more flyover. Um, these are all names that the, uh, the New Horizons team has given them. They haven't been officially sanctioned by the IAU. I'm not sure the IAU wants to sanction a lot of things about Pluto because it would mean admitting that it really maybe is a planet. The IAU gets embarrassed about that whole thing. But again, you can just see this. A lot of this texture change in Pluto is just creating a lot of, of questions and, and interest in terms of what does that mean and what does it mean about other bodies in the, in, out in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, the New Horizons uh, next uh, flight get that, is um, the next object we're going to is actually a very small object and, and very dark. Um, so we're going to sort of go from a, the, one of the biggest objects in the, in the carbon belt to one of the smallest objects. Uh, so it should be some great data and, and comparison on there. Uh, talking about looking for exoplanets before in some of the research. This is an instrument. Um, it was uh, created at the University of Texas uh, in conjunction working with the uh, Korean uh, Astronomical uh, and Space Institute, TASI. And um, it is a entirely new generation technology of uh, petrograph uh, using immersion grading. It's solid state, no moving parts. Uh, very small, as you can see. Uh, it, however, uh, sitting on the DCT uh, outperforms um, the infrared spectrograph on the Keck telescope. So 10 meters of glass and this thing on the 4 meters of glass blows it away. Uh, it is literally both in quantity and quality a generation ahead of any other instrument of its class in the world. And uh, so gives a uh, much wider amount of spectrum coverage uh, in the infrared. Um, the lightweight and the, the design means we could put it right on the back of the telescope. We don't have to have fiber feed it or do anything else like that. Um, it's on the observatory right now for the next three years, six months on, six months off. Uh, most of that six months is going back to University of Texas for upgrades and, and tweaking. Um, and it is going to go down to the Southern Hemisphere uh, to the Gemini Telescope uh, in Chile um, for one six month run. Uh, in the next bit, so it can look at the southern sky. Um, but uh, uh, the UT astronomers were a little grumpy that it went to the Arizona Institution rather than McDonald uh, until they started using it on that telescope and discovered that on our telescope, because it points so nicely. UT, McDonald, I don't know about McDonald, it's got an interesting history. Um, it's one of the few telescopes, being a telescope operator is tough and sometimes can be very frustrating. And the telescope, if the telescope, uh, they all have like personalities, big telescopes. 
So their uh, two meter class telescope is, it doesn't point well. So, you know, it gets in the general area of what it is you told it to go look for, and then you have to do a lot of hunting and searching and pecking to go <coughs> finally get, and you can waste 45 minutes to get on target. Uh, apparently for one telescope operator one night, this was too much. So it being Texas, he went out with his 45 and he shot the primary mirror. And so their mirror actually, they, you know, what, to, what do you do? Um, you know, to replace a primary mirror is not a trivial task and it's years of downtime. So instead what they did is they simply got some black epoxy and they filled in that hole. And so any instrument that goes on the telescope now has to be programmed to know where that black hole of that 45 is. Um, by the way, that person doesn't work there anymore. Uh, <laughs> and as far as I know, it's not worked at any other uh, telescope uh, that, that we know of. Anyway, but um, Igrens is, is one of the or several instruments that our telescope has a very unique design. Basically, uh, where the focal point is uh, falls into uh, the straight through focal point goes to the camera, which we call the LMI, the large monolithic imager. But there's a cube that's mounted on the back of the telescope, and so with, a, with mirrors inside it. So the mirrors can go out of the way, focal point goes straight back to an instrument at the back, the camera. There are four other planes on the cube, and we can put instruments, four more instruments, on the telescope, and then simply flip the mirrors to switch between instruments. Um, this gives us the ability to do a target of opportunity seeing, and so there's an instrument coming from the University of Maryland called RIMAS, which is designed to look at gamma ray bursts. Uh, and the idea, it's, gonna, it's just gonna hang on the telescope, and when a gamma ray burst occurs, within, we, the, we've told them within five minutes, we've tested, we can do it in, in two, and generally less than one, we can repoint the telescope at the gamma ray burst, so that the half-life of the gamma ray burst is measured in, in basically hours. Within a couple of minutes, you can have a four-meter class telescope with what will be the newest generation instrument looking at gamma ray bursts. We're going to get science out of that that, that nobody's, nobody's gotten before. Um, moving on to another. This is an instrument that's uh, just now being installed uh, on the telescope. It's from Yale. Um, this is another spectrograph, uh, incredibly precise uh, measurement of, uh, for example, radial velocities of stars, which is how we detect uh, exoplanets, one way. The mission of Express, within five years of commissioning, they intend to find 100 Earth-like planets around 100 sun-like stars. And to give you an idea of the precision of this, when they talk about extreme precision, they can measure radial velocity changes to within one mile an hour on stars that are really far away. Uh, so um, again, uh, an instrument of quality that does not exist. There are some competitive instruments that are being built, but we expect that in the northern hemisphere sky, this instrument will be unique. Uh, when it comes online, we'll probably have about a three-year lead on anybody else with anything comparable. So that's that's another area of research. And I think that's it. So, Questions. Then I'm gonna we'll get going with the refreshments there like that. And anybody else, if you still have questions, come up and talk to uh, Lowell up here. Mm -hmm. uh, but anybody have a question? Okay. But by the way, I do have some material from the observatory in the. Oh, I don't know if it got reorganized back there. So they're back there somewhere. Uh, and if you like it, also if you if you or anybody you know might be going out to the observatory this year, um, next six to twelve months, I have some guest passes here. So we'll be happy to hand them out to the people who like that. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the talk. It's great. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, visiting the observatories. And it's really cool just to step inside the observatory with Clyde Tomba and made a discovery for uh, Pluto. Not sure if it's a planet or an exoplanet. Maybe you could go a little into that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, uh, 
know you want to ask. Uh, obviously, in this building, I can see that they think it's a planet. Um, it, if you ask the people who are planetary experts, and by the way, the astronomers are not planetary experts. Um, the IAA just, I don't know, because they were around, they got to have a naming convention. Um, they think the IAA decision was just stupid. Um, it was it was political. Um, it was poorly handled. It was not a science-based criteria that was used. I mean, one example by the definition that's there. If you read it, only things that orbit our sun can be called planets. If they orbit some other star, they're not a planet. I don't know what they are. They may be exactly like our planets, but they're not allowed to be called planets. So, I mean, that's just one example of some of the, the it just didn't get a lot of, of thought on it. Um, if you look at all the known bodies in our solar system, not the planetary bodies, on the, not, our, not including the sun, um, Pluto is actually right about in the midpoint in terms of size of, uh, size of planetary bodies in the solar system. Um, the oddballs are big ones. Most of our solar system is made of much smaller bodies. Uh, to be honest with you, what we have found is, it's like that old expression, I don't care what you say about me so long as you spell my name right. Uh, people get very exercised about Pluto having been demoted, and then it ought to be, you know, remoted or something promoted. Um, it's a great way to have a conversation with people about, about science and about you know, how do you define a planet? What, you know, what, what would you say a planet is? So it's great to have a good engaging conversation about it. Scientifically, who cares? I mean, the answer is it's a body of Pluto. Is, it's it's going to keep orbiting. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't care what we say about it. Uh, we've only known it for about one third of a Plutonian year. You know, it hasn't even completed a full orbit around the sun as far as we know. Um, so it, it, it's fine. It's actually, it's, it's fun to poke fingers at the IAU and, you know, we had, we had a couple of our astronomers there uh, and you ought to hear their stories about that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Was Percival Lowell related to Francis Capital? Yes. Um, and, and the other thing, by the way, I want to say, in, in, particularly in front of this group, is remember Percival was an amateur. Percival was an amateur astronomer. He had a big bank account, but he was an amateur. Um, and, and in some ways, it shows you what a good amateur can go to in terms of challenging the status quo, and that's that's a good thing. So, anyhow. other questions? So All right. Is the observatory open to, to the public? It absolutely is open to the public. We have uh, public viewing six nights a week. Uh, we have the grounds are open during the day. We do tours. Um, I mean, the the Clark Telescope that Percival used is one of, I think, two objects in the National Historic Register that are not buildings. I don't know what the other one is, but I've been told there are only two. The Clark, the telescope itself, is the National Historic Register object, uh, not the building. Uh, so, uh, yes, and uh, you know, if you go out there, you can look, you can look through the Clark. And we just spent an awful lot of money um, refurbishing the Clark, rebuilding it. And it now operates actually better than new. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, the lenses on that, Clark, Clark built really, really, really phenomenal instruments. Just great machines. And um, that one is probably one of his best. And it's, it's working really well. Of all the trustees, you look the most like Bristol's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, bear in mind, he had no children. He married very late in life. Um, and we fought with his widow for 10 years after that. So I'm not sure that that's not really the best, best story. But it was a I just back up. Hey, uh, I've had friends tell me I ought to go wear a mustache sometimes. And, uh, I don't smoke cigars. He did. Hey, Lowell, thank you. Very good. July. Thank you. June. Yeah. July. The ATM will be.